Okay, we'll get started. Thank you so much for coming to my talk today. I appreciate that it is late, so I really do appreciate you sticking around. Uh, just to make sure you are in the right place, today we're going to be talking about getting started with Azure private endpoints. So a little introduction to myself before we jump right in. My name is Grace O'Halloran. I'm a senior data engineering consultant with Advancing Analytics. Um, I've been working in data for around six years. <clears throat> with five of those focused on uh, Azure data platforms. Um, and recently, in the last couple of years, I've sort of uh, moved into an area of specialism around network security, uh, specifically around network security of Microsoft data platforms. I'm also a certified um, Azure developer and an Azure administrator as well. I've got my socials on there, so feel free to connect with me. And I also have a blog at the bottom there where I do post quite a lot of content around data-related networking things. So feel free to check that out. <clears throat> so, what to expect from the talk today? I've split it into three main sections. Firstly, we're going to have a really quick introduction into endpoints and the difference between public and private endpoints. Make sure we understand uh, what a private endpoint is and why they are more secure. That's literally going to be about five minutes. And then we're going to jump into the bulk of the talk, <coughs> which I've called my seven steps to success, which I promise you is not a pyramid scheme or a cult. Um, I just realized when I was writing this talk that there were exactly seven things that you need for a successful private endpoint deployment. So we'll go through each of those, um, including quite a little bit about DNS, which I know is everyone's least favorite topic. I'm sorry in advance. And then once we go through the theory, I'll go through a couple of demos so you can see how it actually works in practice with deploying a private endpoint in Azure. Lastly, to wrap up, I'm going to cover some common mistakes, things that I see day in, day out, everybody doing, including myself. I've also done all of these mistakes, hopefully to just save you time, save you some headaches in the future going forward. So why is this so important, right? We're at a data conference. Why am I here talking to you about security? Well, hopefully you guys are the ones that have turned up to the talk, so hopefully you know why it's so important, right? But I think especially in the cloud, as data professionals, engineers, architects, we're kind of expected to do so much these days, uh, especially around networking and security. And I know certainly for me, no one really ever taught me how to do it or told me how it all works. So I kind of just had to figure it out for myself. And I found that having a really, just even a foundational understanding of basic networking principles just really saves me so much time because nine times out of 10 when something doesn't work, it's networking. And eight times out of those nine is DNS. So just understanding how that works just saves you a lot of headaches. So I'm here to spread the good word today and hopefully save you some headaches as well. <clears throat> So what is an endpoint? Um, so I sat down to write a definition of an endpoint, and I was kind of struggling to put it into words. So I did what any self-respecting technology professional in 2023 would do, and I asked ChatGPT to write one for me. Um, so this is what it came up with. An IP endpoint uh, refers to a unique network address that identifies a specific device or application on a network. It's composed of an IP address and a port number. Port numbers are a little bit outside of the scope of this um, talk, but we will be focusing a lot on IP addresses. The combination of the IP address and the port number creates a unique endpoint that can be used for communication and transfer, data transfer, between devices over a network. So an endpoint is just that interface associated with a device on a network that allows those devices to talk to each other. So public versus private endpoints, then. You've probably heard those words being thrown around, right? Uh, and specifically, when we're thinking about Azure resources, you can have public endpoints of those Azure resources, or you can have private endpoints of those Azure resources. So on the next slide, we'll kind of talk about um, the difference between these two in terms of what it actually means. But literally, the difference between these two things is that public endpoints are represented by public IP addresses, and private endpoints are represented by private IP addresses. And that is the main difference at the end of the day. Obviously, that has different impacts, and we'll talk through that in a bit more detail. Just so we're all on the same page, public IP addresses have to be globally unique. That's why we're running out of IPv4 IP addresses, right? Once an IPv4 IP address has been assigned to an endpoint, that is then used up and you cannot no longer reuse the IP address for any other endpoint. 
private IP addresses, however, they do not have to be globally unique. They only have to be locally unique within your private network. Um, so if Mikey has a private network under the address space 10.0.0.0 slash 26, and I have a private network under the same address space, the IP address 10.0.0.4 in Mikey's network is going to represent a completely different endpoint to 10.0.0.4 in my network. Okay? So hopefully that starts to give you a bit of a flavor as to why it might be more secure. But let's dig into that in a bit more detail. So with a public endpoint, because we know they're represented by public IP addresses, this means that the location information of that endpoint is publicly available information, right? You can go and look up the public IP address associated with any particular endpoint. That's publicly available knowledge. And the IP address is resolvable from the public internet. Further to that, by default, if you don't apply any kind of like firewalls or restrictions to that endpoint, anyone can access it, right? So obviously that's not very secure. I've thrown in another option here, which you may have seen in Azure on some of your Azure resources, public endpoint with selected networks enabled. Now, this is slightly more secure than just having a completely unprotected public endpoint, but it's important to note that this is still using the public endpoint. And so the location information of this endpoint is still publicly available. However, it's kind of like a guest list only situation. Um, if your name's not on the list, you're not getting in. So you can restrict the access to certain selected networks and IP address, which obviously is more secure, but it's still not as secure as using a private endpoint. So what does a private endpoint give us? Well, because it's represented by a private IP address, we know that that location information of the endpoint is not publicly available uh, information. That IP address is not resolvable from the public endpoint. So already that is so much more secure. Further to that, you can only access that endpoint from within the private network itself. So you have to be a part of that private network to be able to use that endpoint. So hopefully that gives you a, a bit of an understanding as to why it is so much more secure to use private endpoints and why we want to be using private endpoints um, for our data platforms. So onto the bulk then, the seven steps of success. There are seven things that you need, resources, configuration, settings, um, in order to have a successfully configured private endpoint. Now, you might think that's quite a lot of things. Can you not just hit create private endpoint and be done with it? Um, unfortunately not. And a lot of people do try that and then their private endpoints don't work and they don't know why. So that's why I'm here to tell you today um, the things that you do need to know so that you can go ahead and do that successfully. So I'm going to flash them up on the screen, but I'm not going to explain what they are because we're going to go through each one individually. So step one is a private endpoint resource starting off nice and easy. <laughs> Step two is a coupled Azure resource. Step three is a target sub-resource. Step four is a virtual network which gives you your IP address. Step five is a private DNS zone. Step six is an A record. And step seven is a virtual network link. Hopefully some of those things are familiar to you. Is anyone comfortable with all seven of those? Great, so hopefully, <laughs> not many, so hopefully we can learn something today, that's perfect. Um, my aim for the end of the talk is that you feel comfortable with what all seven of these things are and that you can go away and configure them. So, starting off with step one, a private endpoint. So a private endpoint, some people might not know, is actually a resource in its own right. If you want to create a private endpoint for a storage account, uh, a blob storage account, for example, um, that's not a setting that you go and configure on the storage account. It is a whole separate Azure resource that you need to deploy. So that's the first thing that you need to have an awareness of. Secondly, obviously, if you just deploy a private endpoint resource and don't tell Azure what it's for, it's not going to know. So um, a private endpoint is inherently linked to another um, Azure resource, a coupled Azure resource. So you have to tell it, well, this is the specific storage account that I want this private endpoint to be for. So that's step two. Now, step three is Azure calls it a target sub-resource, and essentially, just telling the private endpoint which resource you want it to be for isn't enough. And that's because resources often have multiple different services, multiple different endpoints associated with it, right? Storage account is a good example because it has a blob service, a table service, a file, a queue, a DFS, a web. And each one of those is represented by a different endpoint. So if you're wanting to create a private endpoint for any of those services, you need a different private endpoint for each one. So upon deployment of the private endpoint, you need to tell it what is your target sub-resource. So in this example, we're choosing blob. 
Step four is the virtual network. Now, obviously, we know we've learned that its core a private endpoint is a private IP address. Um, so it needs to get that private IP address from somewhere. You need to be able to provide a virtual network um, in which it can, you can tell Azure, hey, get the IP address from this particular virtual network. And so when people say, my storage account is in a virtual network, what they, what they mean is there is a private endpoint associated with that storage account, which the IP address of which comes from that virtual network. But that's not as catchy to say, so people don't say that. So steps one to four then, just to recap, we've got a private endpoint resource, a coupled Azure resource, a target sub resource, and a virtual network. I've grouped these together because you can see they're all kind of related to the private endpoint resource itself. Um, and these are all configurations that you need to be aware of. Now, that's the easy part. <laughs> now we move on to steps five through to seven, which is all centered around DNS. I know everybody's least favorite topic. Um, so let's move on to that. So step five is a private DNS zone. Now, before we go into detail about what a private DNS zone is, we need to make sure we understand what DNS is, right? So DNS, for those that don't know, stands for Domain Name System. And the public DNS service is, is um, a service that's available to use for everybody. And I kind of like to think of it as like a big phone book in the sky. You can use it to look up IP addresses of particular domains in the same way that you would use a phone book to look up phone numbers for particular people's names. Um, and like I said, it's a public service that all public endpoints can use. So let's have a look at how this would work in an Azure setting. So we have a storage account. And let's say we want to go to the blob endpoint of this storage account. So that is the fully qualified domain name, the URL associated with that endpoint. Now, to start with, we're just going to talk about public DNS uh, and public endpoints. And then we'll look at how we can change that into a private setting. Okay. So we go to our client, in this case a VM, and I initiate this HTTP request maybe via a short storage explorer or something like that. And the VM doesn't care about domain names, right? It only cares about IP addresses. So what it does is it takes that and it asks the question to Azure DNS, Azure provided DNS. And it goes, my storage account.blob.core.windows.net, what's the IP address for that? Azure provided DNS uses one of its many Azure DNS resolvers to um, initiate that DNS query. And at this point, because we're talking about public DNS, the Azure DNS resolver sends that query out to the, one of the finite number of public DNS servers, which I've depicted with a phone book. Looks through the phone book and it goes, oh, my storage account.blob.core.windows.net. Yeah, you need. Uh, 40.68.176.16, which is a genuine public IP address associated with the West Europe region of the storage account service. Like I said, you can find out all of the public IP addresses that is public available information. So that gets passed all the way back down to the client. The client goes, oh, why didn't you say so in the first place? I know where that is. And it takes you to the, end, the public endpoint of that service. So that's how public DNS works um, with public endpoints. But that's not what we're here to talk about, right? We're here to talk about private endpoints and private DNS. So we know, we've all, I've already given a spoiler, that the solution comes from using a private DNS zone. Now, there are other custom DNS solutions that you can use, but this is kind of the standard Azure native way and kind of a recommended way of doing it. So what is an Azure private DNS zone? Well, first and foremost, it is an Azure resource. Again, in itself, it's something that you have to deploy. They are global resources, so they're not assigned to any particular region, and they're expected to be centralized. So that means if you're working in a hub and spoke architecture, you would expect your private DNS zones to be in the hub. I will explain in the common mistakes section what happens if you don't centralize your private DNS zones, but for now, we just um, assume or just trust me on the fact that it's best practice to have them centralized. Private DNS zones can be thought of like a private phone book, right? Kind of like the contacts list in your phone. Um, you guys can't use my contacts list in my phone to look up the phone number of my dad because you don't have access to it, right? Um, so it's like the public phone book, but private to you. So how do we translate this diagram into a private setting then? So we know that if we have a private endpoint, it means that we're putting our storage account inside a VNet. So let's do that. We're now interested in trying to navigate to this private endpoint. How does that work with DNS? Well, the first uh, few steps of the journey are the same. It goes up to the Azure DNS resolver. 
But this time, instead of going out to the public DNS service, the Azure DNS resolver reroutes the DNS query and it goes, oh, my storage account .blob .core .net. you actually want to go to my storage account .private link .blob .core .net. So Azure private link is the service that underpins private endpoints. And so that's why the private link domain name is called that. So that gets passed back to Azure DNS and it goes, oh, okay, so I need to look for a private DNS zone that handles everything under the domain private link .blob .core .net. And it does that, it knows that because the private DNS zone has to be called that exact domain name. So if you want to use a private DNS zone uh, for blob private endpoints, it has to be called private link .blob .core .net, and that's how Azure DNS finds it. So it redirects to this private phone book instead of using the public one. The private DNS zone goes, oh yeah, my storage account .private link .blob .core .net. you want to go to 10.0.0.8, which is a private IP address. Same as before, it gets passed back down to the client, and the client goes, oh, that's just down the road, let me take you there. And it takes you to the private endpoint of your resource. And we can get in because in this scenario, our client is also inside the virtual network. Okay? So, I mentioned that the private DNS zone has to be called a specific name. How do you know what the name has to be? Well, here's just some examples of different ones. So you need a different private DNS zone for every different type of private endpoint you want to use. So typically for um, the deploy uh, data platform deployments that we do at Advancing Analytics, we typically use eight different private endpoints for our services, which means we need to use eight different private DNS zones, okay? Um, now, I'm not that much of a loser that I memorize these off by heart, um, but I am so much of a loser that this is one of my favorite bookmark links. <laughs> I would recommend you bookmark it too if you work with private endpoints a lot. Um, this is basically just um, tells you what all the private DNS zones need to be called. Um, it has a list of all of the resources and the sub-resources and the associated private DNS zone name. You'll see me using that in the demo. So um, the keen-eyed among you may have noticed that we're only on step five of our seven-step process. So what are the two pieces that are missing? Well, unfortunately, just deploying a private DNS zone resource isn't enough to facilitate this complete DNS query journey. There are two pieces of configurations required um, associated with the private DNS zone in order to finish this setup. So we're going to talk through those now. The first piece of configuration is focused on around how does the private DNS zone know that my storage account .private link .blob .core .net maps to 10.0.0.8. Well, the answer is it doesn't by default. In the same way, when you get a new phone or a new SIM card, it has a contacts list, but there's nothing in it, right? You have to go and populate that information. Same with the private DNS zone. You have to go and add that information in there, and that's called a DNS rec record. In particular, this type of DNS record is called an A record, and so that's step six in our seven-step process. So what is an A record exactly, or DNS records in general? DNS records are the instructions that live in the DNS servers on how to handle DNS queries for a particular domain. There's lots of different types of DNS records, but um, one of the most common types is an A record. An A record specifically contain a domain's associated IP address. So it is literally just that lookup between a domain and an IP address, and that's literally all it is. So going back to our diagram, we can see Inside this private DNS zone, there will be a piece of information that says, this is an A record, this is the domain, and this is the IP address. And that's how it knows to map between that domain and that IP address. Um, a quick aside, um, not something that's part of the seven-step process because you don't need to um, do anything about this yourself. I just found it interesting because I didn't know this before I put this talk together. Um, I wondered how the Azure DNS resolver knows not to go out to the public DNS server, but instead forward that on to the private DNS server. Well, the answer is a different type of DNS record. When you create a private endpoint, Azure automatically creates what's called a CNAME record for you in the Azure DNS resolvers, and a CNAME record maps one domain to another domain, so it's kind of like a forwarding record, right? So that's how it knows um, to forward that query onto my storage account dot private link dot blob dot core dot windows dot net. Again, not something you need to be aware of, just something I thought was interesting. <laughs> so. That's, we know step six is the A record. What is the final step in the process? 
Well, the final step in the process is to do with how does this VM have any awareness of this private DNS zone, right? I know I said that they're meant to be centralized, but there's nothing stopping you from deploying multiple private DNS zones. And we know that for a particular type of DNS zone, it has to have that specific name. So you could have 10 different private DNS zones in your Azure environment, all called privatelink.blob.core.windows.net. So how does that VM know which of those DNS zones is the one that contains the A record that it needs to get to? Well, again, it doesn't by default. You have to tell it. And that's called a VNet link or a virtual network link. So let's have a look at that. Uh, so, like I said, by default, VNets are not aware of private DNS zones, okay? So any client, such as a VM that's inside that VNet, it cannot use that zone to look up addresses because if it doesn't know where it is, right? So we have to explicitly connect VNets to private DNS zones, and this is what's called a VNet link. Once a VNet is linked to a private DNS zone, any client then within that uh, VNet can successfully send DNS queries to that zone. So they've gained access to that private DNS zone, okay? So that's VNet link. Um, it's a property that's added on the DNS zone itself. Um, and once we've added that VNet link, anything inside that VNet can then use that private DNS zone to look up IP addresses against that domain. Whew, we got there. So <laughs> to summarize the seven things, We've got a private endpoint resource. We need to tell it what is the coupled Azure resource that goes with it. As well as that, it needs to know the target sub-resource. And it also needs a virtual network in which it can pull its IP address from. Sets one to four, all associated with the private endpoint itself. Set five is the private DNS zone resource. Step six is the A record. And step seven is the virtual network link. Again, steps five to seven are all centered around the private DNS zone, OK? So let's jump into a demo and see that working. And fingers crossed, it all goes OK. Oh, perfect. Good start. So oh, you can't see my screen. Let me duplicate. Um, Fala, can I borrow you a second? Your hotspot has disconnected from my laptop. Unfortunately, I found out um, a few hours ago that the, uh, the ICC Wi-Fi blocks RDP access to VMs, which completely ruins my entire demo. Um, so bear with me two seconds. Is that one? Mm, yeah. And I will just log back into my VM because that has gone down. So whilst I'm doing that, I'll try and just explain what I'm going to show you. So I have a resource group in Azure and I have a VM inside a private network and we have a storage account in there. And I'm going to show you um, a couple of different ways of how to deploy a private endpoint through the portal. Um, and then we'll see that um, when we block public access, we won't be able to get into the storage account from just my normal browser on my computer. But if we go into the VM, which is inside the private network, we'll be able to get in and we know that our private endpoint is successfully working. So let me now duplicate my screen. OK. Can you see that? OK, yes, perfect. So here is my um, resource group. As I said, we've got the virtual network there. I do have a bunch of VMs whilst I was trying to get it to work earlier, but we're just going to use one of them. Um, so this is the storage account in question. OK, so let's take a look at that. Now, anything to do with networking is down here under security and networking. We go over to the networking pane. And you can see at the moment on this page, uh, firewalls and virtual networks. Um, I have enabled from all networks selected, right? So if I head into containers and try and look at a blob just from the browser on my normal computer, you'll see that I'm able to get into my data completely unprotected, right? Obviously, we want to change that. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go over and hit disable on the public network access, OK? If we're using private endpoints, we don't need any public network access, so just hit that to disabled. Private endpoint connections are handled over here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead. You see we don't have any at the moment. I'm going to go ahead and create a private endpoint. So I'm just going to give it a name. 
And I'm going to specify that this is a blob endpoint. Is that the right region? So that's step one. We're creating a private endpoint resource, OK? Step two, now when you create this for a storage account through the storage account resource itself, it recognizes that it's that storage account you want to create the private endpoint for. So that's step two sorted. Not every resource does this. No idea why, but for storage account, it's smart enough to figure it out. So that's step two, the couple de jour resource. Step three, we need to tell it which is the target sub resource. So I said we're going to go for blob. And step four is on the next page, which is selecting the right virtual network. So all you need to do, select the right VNet and select the right subnet. So I'm going to put this in the second subnet. So my first subnet has the VM, second subnet I've reserved for private endpoints. So that's set one to four covered. Now you'll notice it's quite, you can't really get away with not filling these in. It won't let you, they're mandatory. So it's not really a case of you might miss these out, but it's certainly a case of you might configure one of them incorrectly. So it's still good to be aware of if you deploy your private endpoint and it's not working, just check that those, um, the, the couple de jour resource is correct. You've selected the correct target sub resource and you've selected the right virtual network as well. So handily for us, when creating a private endpoint through the portal, it has this DNS section and it says private DNS integration. To connect privately with your private endpoint, you need a DNS record. So it's telling us you need an A record. And the recommended way of doing that is via the private DNS zone. So if you tick integrate with private DNS zone as yes, that essentially means it's going to add an A record for you in the chosen private DNS zone. Now, you can see here under the private DNS zone that I have new in brackets, which means I don't have a pre-existing DNS zone, but it's going to create one for us. So here we're ticking off steps five and six together. It's going to create us a private DNS zone, and it's going to add an A record in it for us, which is fantastic. So I'm going to go ahead and hit that to deploy. And whilst that is deploying, I'm just going to log into Azure. Oh, no, it's still there. Perfect on my VM. So hopefully this doesn't take too long, and we should start to see the resources coming through. Uh, fingers crossed. So we'll see the private endpoint come through before the um, private DNS zone is deployed. There we go. So the private endpoint has appeared there. I'm going to show you what it looks like on the storage uh, account itself. So if we head back over to that private endpoint connections page, you'll see now we have a, a private endpoint connection there. The private endpoint bit is hyperlinked because, as we know, that is its own Azure resource. So we're going to head over to that Azure resource to see what it looks like. Um, it does also uh, deploy a NIC or network interface card. That is basically the thing that contains the IP address information. Again, a bit beyond the scope of this talk. Um, but you can see you can check a lot of those configurations at the top here. You can check your VNet is correct. You can check the couple de jour resource is correct. And you can check the um, sub resource type is correct as well, blob. Perfect. Now, where I spend most of my time is down here on the DNS configuration pane. OK, so if we head over here, you can see that the, it has some information from the network interface card. So that's where you can find your IP address that's been associated uh, with your private endpoint. And hopefully, if we click refresh, you can see on the bottom here, we have some configuration there associated with DNS. Now, what we've got here is essentially, if you have this information on your DNS configuration pane, that means that A, you have a private DNS zone for that private endpoint, and B, it means you have an A record, because you can see there it's got the fully, fully qualified domain name of the private link endpoint and the associated IP address. So all this is doing is it's taking information from the private DNS zone and kind of surfacing it here for you to look at. But all of this is just stuff that's in the private DNS zone but it's handy to see it here, right? So if we head over to the private DNS zone, we can see we've got a private DNS zone resource that's been deployed. Um, on the overview page, you'll see all of your DNS records. This first one is just a default DNS record that is always deployed with a private DNS zone just to make the Azure internals work. But you can see here we have an A record that's been deployed as well. So if we click into this, you can see it's got the domain and it's got the IP address and it's of type A. Perfect. <clears throat> so. The last piece of configuration that we need to check is step seven, which is the virtual network link. 
Now, um, I said that the virtual network link is actually a property on the private DNS zone as opposed to a piece of information you insert into the private DNS zone, like the A record. So you go to your private DNS zone, and under settings here, there's a section called virtual network links. Now, if we go to virtual network link, um, you can see um, that a link has been added for us. Now, this doesn't always happen. The reason why it was able to add the VNet link for us is because when we did the private endpoint deployment, we asked it to also deploy a new private DNS zone for us. Because it was deploying a new DNS zone for us, it was able to add that VNet link during that deployment. However, you'll see in the next uh, example, if you have a pre-existing DNS zone and you're just asking it to integrate with a pre-existing DNS zone, because it's not actually doing any deployment on the DNS zone, it won't be able to add the VNet link for you. So it's important to know the seven things you need to check, because depending on how exactly you deploy things, Azure handles a different number of them for you. And it's very easy to end up with one of the pieces missing and you not realize. So we should have all the pieces of the puzzle, fingers crossed. So if we head back to um, our storage account, you should be able to see that from the public internet, I still can't get in because we disable public network access, OK? But if I switch into my VM, and hopefully the DNS hasn't cached because it can do. Perfect, we can get in, OK? So I can't get in from outside of my network, but from inside of my network, I can get in, which means I know that my public access is disabled, but my private endpoint is working. Perfect, we've been able to deploy a private endpoint. So let's have a look at a second example. Um, so this time, I'm going to deploy a, a private endpoint for the table sub-resource of my storage account. Yes. Oh, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> How, does anyone know how to change it to light mode? Hmm? In where you were in the settings, it's the settings on. In here? Appearance and view? Yeah. That one. Settings, yeah. In here? And then oh, OK. Uh, thinking about it? Yeah. Apply on the bottom. Oh, OK, cool. Is that better? Yeah. Wow, that's aggressive. <laughs> oh, <laughs> need some sunglasses. <laughs> no problem. Um, is that better? Perfect. OK, so um, in this example, is where I'm going to try and replicate a more realistic scenario. Now, I mentioned that private DNS zones are supposed to be centralized. What that means is that um, you will likely have your private DNS zones in the hub if you're working in a, a hub and spoke architecture. Now, what that means, if you're a developer, an engineer, you're likely going to be working in your spoke, and you're probably not going to have permissions over the hub, right? as it should be, um, if those private DNS zones are being used by lots of different applications and they have lots of different A records in there for lots of different private endpoints, you don't want individual development teams or engineering teams having permissions over those zones. So the likelihood is, a more realistic scenario, is that you're going to have pre-existing DNS zones. So you're going to want to, you're going to want to deploy your private endpoint and integrate that with a pre-existing DNS zone rather than deploying one through your private endpoint deployment. So I'm going to create a private DNS zone now to show you what it looks like. Um, and we're going to, if it wants to do it, <laughs> this is me replicating the private DNS zone um, already existing. Okay. So I'm going to show you, oh, in fact, I'm just going to move out of my VM. I forgot that I was still inside of my VM. Okay. Um, go ahead and create a private DNS zone. So I'll show you that link that we talked about earlier, how I know what to call it. It's going to be for the table sub-resource type um, of the, that's the private endpoint type that we're going to deploy. So I go to my trusty uh, list of private DNS zones, and I just do Control F on, oh, help if I could spell, on table, and I find the right name, and I copy that. And that is literally all you need to do to deploy a private DNS zone. So nice and simple. But like I said, you probably won't be the people responsible for doing this. This is likely going to sit with a centralized um, 
platform team and a, a, a networking team maybe or an infrastructure team. So we're running a bit low on time. So I'm going to go ahead and create the private endpoint for my storage account. So I'm going to come to networking, private endpoint connections. You can see we've got the blob one on there already, but I'm going to create one for the table. Cool. Step one, step two, the uh, associated, the couple de jour resource. Step three, the target sub resource. We're going to select table. Step four, uh, select the correct virtual network and subnet. Now, on the DNS pane, um, you can see that it's recognized the fact that we have a pre existing DNS zone. It doesn't say new next to it. Um, so, if you had permissions over the private DNS zone, it would come up here and you could connect it. And in this instance, it would add the A record for you, but as I said before, it wouldn't add the VNet link. However, the situation that I want to replicate, which is more realistic, is actually nothing would come up here because you don't have permission over that private DNS zone. So you wouldn't even be able to see that it exists. So you wouldn't be able to integrate it. So you'd have no choice but to select no. So we're going to go ahead and deploy that. So in this scenario, we have steps one to four covered. We do have step five covered because we know a private DNS zone exists. We just don't have any permissions over it. Okay. Um, so whilst that's deploying, and before you even create your private endpoints, you probably know that you're going to want to resolve your private endpoints from your spoke network. So you can go ahead and speak to the um, platform team, whoever is responsible for the um, private DNS zones, and say, hey, can you add a virtual network link for me for my spoke VNet? And they'll go in here, go to virtual network links, click add, give it a random name and just select the right VNet. So that's something that you can do before you've even deployed your private endpoints and you know that that's in place. So going back to the storage account, hopefully our second private endpoint has deployed at this point, heading over to the networking page, and you can see we have a table private endpoint there. Um, now, because we didn't integrate it with the DNS zone, it's not added an A record for us, so we need to go and do that ourselves. And you can see that that configuration is missing from the bottom there. Now, you can go and add a DNS, uh, an A record inside the private DNS zone, or rather you can ask that centralized team that has permission to go and do that for you. Really, really frustratingly, if you add an A record directly into the DNS zone, it doesn't back populate into the configuration here which is so frustrating, especially if you don't have permission over the DNS zone, because that's useless to you, because you can't see the A record in the DNS zone. So for me, having that information in here is invaluable from a debugging perspective so that I know there's definitely an A record in place. So the better way to do it is ask whoever has permission over the DNS zone to come in here and click Add Configuration. And all they need to do is select the right private DNS zone, leave everything else the same, and you'll see that that populates the configuration pane at the bottom here. It shows us the connected DNS zone. It shows us the fully qualified domain name mapping to the IP address, so we know that we have an A record. Perfect, we have that information there. And if you go to the private DNS zone, hopefully if we click refresh, you can see it's also added an A record in there as well. So that kills two birds with one stone, and I much prefer doing it that way. It makes your life so much easier. So we have a private DNS zone. We know we've got all of, uh, sorry, we have a private endpoint for the table endpoint. Um, and hopefully now we can, from inside our VM, we can get in. So if I go to tables, I can get in and I can add a table. Perfect, my private endpoint is working. If I went to the outside, um, hopefully, yep, doesn't let us in because we disabled public network access, okay? So you can see that depending on how you um, deploy your private endpoints and depending on what permissions you have, a different number of those configurations are handled for you. So it's really important to have an awareness of those seven things because nearly always when something is broken, it's just that you're missing one of those seven things, right? You're missing an A record, you're missing a VNet link, and it's really easy to fix. And everyone loves you for it because everyone's tearing their hair out because the private endpoints aren't working. So to wrap up, I just want to talk quickly about two common mistakes, things that I literally see time and time again and things that I've done myself, which have caused me days of pain. And so hopefully I can take some of that away from you guys if you're going away to work with some private endpoints. So I've talked a lot about the fact that um, DNS zones should be centralized, but I haven't really explained why. So I'm going to talk through an example now.
So this is an architecture setup where we've got a hub and spoke setup. We've got two different um, uh, developer teams working on two different platforms at the same time in two different spokes. They both happen to be using the exact four different types of private endpoints. They know that in order to deploy a successful private endpoint, they need private DNS zones, so they go ahead and deploy the private DNS zones. Now, we know that private DNS zones have to have a specific name, right? So these DNS zones are going to be called exactly the same thing as these DNS zones. They're going to need to, do, to resolve their private endpoints from their own spoke network, so they know they need to add a VNet link, so they both go ahead and do this. So what's wrong with this? At present, nothing. This works, right? The issue comes when you want to be able to resolve private endpoints from outside of your spoke network, which is a very valid um, situation, especially in a hub and spoke architecture, because you are likely going to have things coming in from the hub. Maybe you have things coming from on-prem via the hub, like end users, or maybe even services like self-hosted integration runtimes for Azure Data Factory, which need to be able to resolve your private endpoints. Similarly, you might have things in the hub, like um, a central repository of servers that are reserved for things like Azure DevOps build agents, which also need to be able to access your private endpoints. Now, private DNS zones don't respect VNet peering. So you're sat there thinking, well, that's fine, Grace. You just add a VNet link to your hub. What's the problem? What's, what are you going on about? Well, unfortunately, this is where it all breaks down. The reason being is that although you can have um, thousands of VNet links on one DNS zone, unfortunately, you cannot do it the other way around. So you cannot have the same VNet linked to more than one of the same type of private DNS zone. So if you have a blob DNS <laughs> zone over here and a blob DNS zone over here, you can't link the same VNet to both of those DNS zones. So that's exactly the situation we have here. We have the hub network trying to be linked to multiple of the same type of DNS zones. And it doesn't let you. This turns into a race of whichever spoke gets there first, right? So if spoke one adds a VNet link for the hub, when spoke two tries to do that, it'll say, sorry, you can't do this. It's already been linked, and everything breaks down. And you can see how this is quite a common scenario when working in a hub and spoke architecture. So we know the solution already. Centralize your private DNS zones, have them in the middle, uh, and just link as many VNets as you need, basically. And uh, it saves you all of those headaches, which I've definitely been through myself. <laughs> Lastly, um, we touched a little bit on the selected networks option. Um, so I just, I've shown you an example here where I've uh, enabled that. And I've added a VNet on there, and I've added an IP address to show you what that looks like. Now, I mentioned it earlier, but everything on this pane is related to public endpoints. And people don't think that, including myself until you know a couple of years ago. And I think it's because it's called firewalls and virtual networks. It sounds secure, right? <laughs> but everything on this page is related to public network access. And it does actually say it right there. And I, I was embarrassingly recently until I realized this actually explicitly stated this was a public network access option, right? So yes, you can enable selected virtual networks and IP addresses, but all you're doing is poking a hole in your network and allowing them in through the public endpoint, which is fine if that's the, you know, if that's the security approach that you're taking. But if you're wanting to work with private endpoints, you don't want to be doing this. Now, the best case scenario is you deploy a private endpoint, you deploy it successfully, and you have this on here as well. The best case scenario is it will actually use the private endpoint, but then you just have a load of extra useless configuration on here that's being ignored. That's the best case scenario. Unfortunately, the worst case scenario is quite a lot worse. The worst case scenario, and I think the thought process goes like this. You deploy a private endpoint, you don't know the seven things, right? So you're not aware that you need to check for an A record, a VNet link, et cetera. Um, and so your private endpoint doesn't work. You go to the networking pane of your resource. This is the first thing you see. And you go, oh, I probably need to select enable selected networks, right? That's why it's not working. So you do that. You add your VNet. Everything works. Fantastic. And you move on with your life. Then someone like me comes along and goes, I thought you said your data platform was protected by private endpoints. And you go, it is. I say, well, turn that to disabled then, because this is all public network access. You don't need that. And they're a bit hesitant because they know that if they set it to disabled, everything's going to break. So they do that. Everything breaks. I'm the bad guy. Um, and then it's like, OK, well, actually, your private endpoint was never working. And no one knew 
because people aren't like me and inspect the network logs, right? So no one realized that everything this whole time was just going through the public endpoint, which obviously that's, that's quite a drastic thing if you're telling everyone that it's secured by private endpoints. So the worst case scenario is that, and the best case scenario is this was just a load of useless nonsense anyway, because your private endpoint is, is, is working and you don't need this. So my advice to you, if you want to work with private endpoints, please, please, please just set this to disabled and leave it alone. <laughs> it will save you a world of pain. So that brings us to the end of the talk. Um, hopefully you feel comfortable now with what a private endpoint is and why we want to use them. Hopefully you can remember the seven things that you need to know and hopefully you feel empowered and a little bit more confident to take that away and successfully deploy a private endpoint. If you do do that, please do reach out to me, let me know, I'd love to see, um, see you working with them and if you found it useful. Um, and obviously the feedback uh, link is there as well. I really would appreciate any and all feedback. Thank you so much, and I will be sticking around for questions as well. <laughs> you have questions? Yeah. 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 Do we, do we still need a private endpoint? Yes, yeah, because um, the express route just takes you into the network. Oh, sorry, yeah. So the question was, um, if you have on-prem traffic traveling into your Azure environment via an express route, do you still need private endpoints? Yeah, so your express route is taking you into the network, but if none of your endpoints are in that network, it won't be able to get into them, right? So having things inside a network means having private endpoints. But if you've got multiple VMs running, a your storage running, yep. and databases, so you have to create private endpoint for every single resource? Yes, if you, if you want to access mm -hmm. everything via a private network oh, and sorry. keep the traffic within the private network without going out to the internet, you need to have private endpoints. Yeah. Otherwise, it goes into the private network and then goes out to the internet and back in through the public endpoint. So you, but that's kinda... why we got the express route, because express route is a dedicated line yeah. Yes. So, which means that um, no one can access it from the outside. Yeah. So you, the, there's no public access. But what's access the endpoint that? that you're accessing from the express route? Where is the express route traffic going to? What's the destination? To the to the Azure cloud. Um, yeah, but if but in terms of the VM, as an example, yeah. how is that express route traffic then going to the VM? Okay. Is it a public IP address that it's going to? In which case, it'll go back out to the internet and come back in through the public endpoint. Or if it's a private IP address that you yeah. want to navigate to, that's a private endpoint. Private endpoint. Yeah. So it's just the representation of that device inside the network. So you're absolutely right. You do want an express route. You need other things in place as a wider secure network architecture. It's not enough to just have private endpoints. You're absolutely right. But that doorway into your service, if you want that to be co completely contained within your private network, you have to use a private endpoint. No worries. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions? No? Cool. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. You're free to go. <laughs>